here we are back together again, friends, for another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. Jesse is the father of a nine-year-old daughter who has type 1 diabetes. She was diagnosed just a year ago, and she's already taking a big chunk of the care on herself and has an A1C in the sixes. Nothing you hear on the Juice Box podcast should be considered advice, medical or otherwise. Always consult a physician before making any changes to your healthcare plan. When you place your first order for AG1 with my link, you'll get five free travel packs and a free year's supply of vitamin D. Drink AG1.com slash juice box. Don't forget, if you're a U.S. resident who has type 1 or is the caregiver of someone with type 1, visit T1DExchange.org slash juice box right now and complete that survey. It will take you 10 minutes to complete the survey, and that effort alone will help to move type 1 diabetes research forward. It will cost you nothing to help. I know that Facebook has a bad reputation, but please give the private Facebook group for the Juice Box Podcast, a healthy once over. Juice Box Podcast, Type 1 Diabetes. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast is sponsored by Cozy Earth. Use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout at CozyEarth.com and you will save. 40% off of your entire order. The episode you're listening to is sponsored by U.S. Med. USmed.com slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. You can get your diabetes testing supplies the same way we do from U.S. Med. This show is sponsored today by the glucagon that my daughter carries, Gvoke Hypopen. Find out more at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. Hello, everyone. My name is Jesse. I am a dad of a nine-year-old daughter, Brianna, who was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes in February of 23. February of 23. She's nine now or was nine then? She was eight then. Okay. Correct. It's been a challenging year. Yeah. Do you have any other kids? So my son is five and his, so my daughter was in the hospital February 21st and his birthday is February 24th. So we were just, in fact, she told the doctors, I want to be discharged so I could go home for my brother's birthday. Did you have the birthday in the hospital or did she make it home? We made it home, which was awesome. Very cool. Was this a surprise? Do you have type 1 in your family? It was a complete surprise. No diabetes in the family. Okay. How about now that you've been with it for over a year? Other autoimmune stuff that you've noticed with yourselves or her? Yes. So in 2014, um, and that's the year that she was born, I had issues that were undiagnosed for five years. And in 2019, I was diagnosed with autoimmune disorders. Um, I've had two of them. One of them is Sjogren's and the other is uh, Hashimoto's, which is also news to me. It's, it's new to the family. Okay. That I'm aware of. So you think your Hashimoto's symptoms go back for years? It's kind of tough because I think my primary is definitely Sjogren's and I check just about every single box for that. And I denied it for like a year or two saying there's no way how could i have this it doesn't make sense it's got to be something else you know continuously trying to look and find an answer but i check almost every single box for that the hashimoto's to date i still do don't require any treatment or anything my levels are still relatively normal but I have the presentation, you know, the scan of my thyroid and everything gives me the presentation of Hashimoto's. Can I ask you, do you have any symptoms of it? No. No? And what, what are your PSH levels when they measure them? I don't know offhand, but they're, they're all within normal range. And they, in fact, I recently saw a second endocrinologist for a second opinion. 
and still have to do the blood work on that. Mm-hmm. But I have been tested multiple times for my uh, TSH levels, and they're relatively normal. Yeah, so there's a pretty wide range in the testing. So if you mm-hmm. are over like 2.1, TSH and you have symptoms, they might still tell you you're in range. But if that ever happens and you have yeah. symptoms, tell them you'd like to treat the symptoms. Yeah, because at that point, like I said, the doctor wasn't willing to treat anything. That's why I'm looking for that second opinion, because I, I have most of my everyday symptoms are answered by the Sjogren's, but there are a couple things that are still unanswered. And it's, you know, question us is it rheumatoid arthritis is it Hashimoto's is it other things what do you have joint pain muscle tightness is a is a big one that really isn't answered by Sjogren's stiff back stiff neck yeah yeah all the time crack your neck doesn't matter cracks again five seconds later I have a spot in my shoulder blade that is just a constant knot and it's you know Mm -hmm. and it's not answered by anything orthopedic so it's kind of like arden has all that mm-hmm. interesting yeah is she, she diagnosed with hashimoto's as well or just the diabetes? She, yeah she has she takes um two thyroid medications she takes uh tyrosine yeah. for t4 replacement she takes cytomel for t3 replacement if you take insulin or sulfonyl ureas you are at risk for your blood sugar going too low you need a safety net when it matters most be ready with Gvoke HypoPen. My daughter carries Gvoke HypoPen everywhere she goes because it's a ready-to-use rescue pen for treating very low blood sugar in people with diabetes ages 2 and above that I trust. Low blood sugar emergencies can happen unexpectedly, and they demand quick action. Luckily, Gvoke HypoPen can be administered in two simple steps, even by yourself in certain situations. Show those around you where you store Gvoke Hypopen and how to use it. They need to know how to use Gvoke Hypopen before an emergency situation happens. Learn more about why Gvoke Hypopen is in Arden's Diabetes Toolkit at gvokeglucagon.com slash juicebox. Gvoke shouldn't be used if you have a tumor in the gland on the top of your kidneys called a pheochromocytoma, or if you have a tumor in your pancreas called an insulinoma. Visit gvokeglucagon.com slash risk for safety information. Hmm. But she's like, we could start an ASMR podcast of just Arden cracking herself. I mean, every, so in my journey to getting diagnosed, I had a lot of physical therapy and physical therapy seemed to be the only thing that helped me. And, but it's only temporary. Every therapist I've been to, every doctor I've been to is just a massage therapist. Their first comment is, wow, you're really tight. And I'm like, yeah, that's just my muscles. Hey, Jesse, can you hyperextend your elbows, your arms? Are you super stretchy? Can you pitch a baseball really well? Anything like that? No. No. I would say my joints are pretty flexible, like especially my neck. I mean, it's tight and it cracks. But at the same time, the chiropractors that I've seen have also said there's a lot of motion. Yeah. So you could maybe have you looked into um, Ehlers Danlos syndrome? I've heard of that and I have checked into that at some point. Also, you're much louder right now. So whatever you just did, let's keep doing that. Okay. 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 Um, yeah. So that's an autoimmune issue that would be highlighted mainly with like super flexible flexibility. Because your ligaments are extra stretchy, you might get like over like hypermobility, I guess would be an easy way to say it. And there is no real treatment for it other than physical therapy. So that might be while why while you're doing the physical therapy, it's better, but then it doesn't stay better. Gotcha. It's E-H-L-E-R-S-D-A-N-L-O-S if you want to look into it. Awesome. Yeah, that could definitely be it. And the thyroid thing. Again, if you have a TSH over 2.1, like say your thyroid's like three and a half that, or four, and your doctor's going to go, that's in range. You would say, I would prefer to be under two. Can we medicate it under two? It's one little pill. You take it like once a day. I just pulled up a 2020 result and it's 2.090. Okay. Yeah. So I, almost 2.1. No almost. one would medicate that. I, I, I wouldn't yeah. see anybody medicating that, but it's a watch for sure. Yeah. It's uh, And that's 2020. So. Yeah. Okay. No. Well, 
uh, how about when you think back on your your family, your connected family, your mother, your father, aunts, uncles? Up until recently, the only thing would be my grandmother had rheumatoid arthritis. Mm -hmm. And that was the only known diagnosed, you know, autoimmune in the family. In the family until recently, my aunt on my mother's side and my grandmother's on my mother's side. My aunt was just recently diagnosed with uh, celiacs. Okay. I so see. That's... Are you guys Irish? <laughs> Italian. Italian. Okay. <laughs> yep. Interesting. I, do you have, yeah. um, I'm going to, I hope you don't mind on pick. I know you probably, but I think I'm getting to your topic. So give me a second. Um, anxiety for you? Uh, no, 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 nothing over the top. No. Okay. okay. You know, it's funny. I'm just going to, I'm going to throw this out there because I want to get into your topic, right? You know, you, you sent a little note. Everybody sends a note about like what they want to talk about. And because I hope you take this the right way, <laughs> you have an androgynous name. Mm -hmm. So I didn't know if I was going to be talking to a man or a woman today. And now I'm going to say something that people are probably going to find offensive. I found your note. I get, I was guessing you were going to be a woman. Be Interesting. Because you spoke so much about trauma in your note. It's interesting. I mean, so when I started my pitch, my pitch was, hey, Scott, I'm just a dad. I'm just a 45-year-old dad. And it's just like, I'm just a regular dad kind of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but I will tell you that this diagnosis hit me hard. My mm -hmm. wife was the champion, the... Let's put all that crap aside and full steam ahead. Let's figure this out and get going. And I was, holy shit, now what? You know, like stuck. Was, was that your personality prior to it? No, no, no. Like I'm, I'm, I think I'm often the problem solver. The let's deal with reality. We need to get to the next step. Um, my wife is also like that. Um, both type A people you know, that just let's go, let's, you know, get things done. Right. Um, uh, the, you know, there's, there's, you know, going back to college, you know, a breakup hit me hard. Generally, I'm not the emotional guy. I'm the let's do, you know, I'm very task oriented. And for some reason, this, not for some reason, this just hit me. Yeah. You think it could be because it is your daughter? hundred percent. You know, it's like when it's your own kids and it's the same thing, like, uh, anything medical, you could give me gunshot wounds, stabbings, somebody bleeding all over the place. And I'm calm, cool, collected. No problem. My daughter gets a paper cut and my wife is often like, get out of the way. Let me do this. <laughs> and it's like, it's it's my daughter. It's, I don't need this guy crying on the band aids. We gotta. Go. <laughs> I'm telling you, like she literally pushes me out of the way and says, "Get out of here. You're no help." <laughs> so, and it, and it's it's strange for me because like that that's like my um that's my wheelhouse. That's I you know I have no problem with that, but it's my daughter and I just I crumble. Do you freeze or do you fall apart? Um. I just fall apart. I don't, I don't freeze. Like I, I definitely act, but I'm a mess. You know, it's just, uh, mm -hmm. not the typical, uh, my wife's right. Get out of the way. You're not. <laughs> it's crazy. So, Tell me about, about Brianna's diagnosis. Then how did you guys figure it out? Well, it's, it's kind of like mirrors, you know, everybody else's story leading up to it. She was super tired. We had just gone to Disney in December. In December, all the way back then, uh, she wasn't herself. Like, I remember saying it to my wife, like, she's awfully quiet. She's not quite herself. Mm -hmm. And then come February, you know, up until it, she, the, the bedwetting is, was the final clue that, you know, we're like, something's not right. We, you know, we did the research, we looked and we're like, hmm, diabetes, maybe she has diabetes. And, you know, uh, like a typical parent would do, I went into denial and I was like, nah, nah, that, that seems crazy. But again, she checked the boxes. So we scheduled an appointment with the pediatrician just prior to the bedwetting. And then she wet the bed and like the following, like, I don't know, it was like four days away or whatever that we had the appointment previously scheduled. So we're like, okay, let's get her to the doctors and see what happens. 
And I'll never forget it because I don't know what happened, but I, I promised Brianna, I was like, yeah, well, I'll get you a smoothie. So let's go get a smoothie. We'll go to the doctor or whatever. We just happened to be running late. So I was like, all right, the smoothie is going to have to wait until after the appointment because we're running really late. Mm -hmm. Go in. I knew what was going to happen. I knew they were going to check her sugar. And I don't know if I expected it to be high or not because I really didn't really believe it. I was like, there's no way. Yeah. Um, But sure enough, they checked it. She was, I I forget what the number was, but by the time we got to the hospital, it was close to I think it was 600. You know, you and I live so close to each other. I think you might have gone to my kid's pediatrician as possible. <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, it's like, it's crazy because it's funny because the office that we normally go to, we went to a different office because it was the available appointment. Right. They were like, you have to, they, I think they did the finger stick there, but we, or the, the urine test, but we had to go to the other office to do a finger stick or something. I, I forget. It's kind of all a blur. Uh, it, they made us go to her, the other office in another town before we went to the hospital. Were you, well, maybe it wasn't my pediatrician. It sounds like a, sounds like a, we got to get you to a better place. Wait, but so wait, so what are the, um, were the four of you together or did you just no, go? It was just me and her. Why did was, they send captain it, crumble? How come your wife didn't go? Did you, oh, you didn't know this about yourself yet. No, I, well, that's true too. Yeah. Like, I mean, I wasn't crushed at that point. Mm-hmm. So like, you know, but still dealing with her with any true emergencies, it's not, not the best. But how often um, does that really happen? Yeah, outside it, do- of- and it doesn't. Yeah. So it wasn't like anything, you know, that's super known. But mm-hmm. then after that, it was like, I just went into like a tailspin <laughs> pretty quickly. That day? No, no. I, I think the, the during the hospital stay, like it was just, you know, once we got the confirmation, once, you know, they did the finger stick and sending us to the hospital, like it, I mean, I, I knew at that point. And once we got to the ER and they did the intake and whatever the number was, six, 700, I don't quite remember, but it was definitely high at that point. I wouldn't say I was crumbling. But it was like, oh, my God, you know, like it was just. Well, what were the thoughts that were getting you? Do you remember specific things that were were alarming to you? I mean, I listen, I understand the whole thing's alarming, but were there things that stood out? I think for me and I think why it hits me, hit me hard is and I think a lot of parents will say this, but like Brianna is a very bright eight-year-old. She's in gifted and talented. She's super smart. She has so much going for her. Super mature, you know, bright girl, really nice, great friends, you know, just everything about it is like, this is perfect daughter kind of thing. Just knowing the diagnosis, it, it was just... Did you think her life was over? Yeah. Yeah. That That's, you know, and it, again, it goes to then my wife pulled me back in like, hello, this isn't cancer. Like, you know, this isn't death sentence, yeah. you know, so to speak. So yeah, like, you know, I, in my mind, this totally changed her life. You know, it, I didn't view it as a speed bump. I viewed it as crushing. Like a crash. Like, like yep. we, we, oh my God, she only made it seven, eight years. And now, yep. her, and now her, all the promise of her life is gone. How is she going to do those things that we envisioned, you know, you know, her bright future and right. just taken away or gone a little, you know, reality, a little knowledge and understanding what diabetes is and knowing that it is not a stage four cancer or something like that. I mean, once reality sets in, it's not that doom and gloom, but I, I still had a really hard time with why her, you know, like that, Mm -hmm. why did they, why God pick her? You know, why does she have to go through this? That type of stuff. Was your life going really well up until then? I mean, it it was good. Good. Okay. Not like you, like, but things were going the way you expected. I guess that's more my, yeah, that, so that's how I felt, right? Like things weren't easy, but they were going, I had a goal 
we had goals together, things were moving towards those goals as expected. Exactly. Yeah. Then the diabetes is like, it felt like the thing that really, I was going to, well, it, it like, it fucked me up because I was like, it's maybe the first time as an adult that I thought, oh, I have no control over any of this. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's you know, all that taken from you, the, you know, you have zero control. And as far as, I want to say like the outlook, I mean, prognosis or whatever, like at that point, you don't, you're not really in tune to all the nuances of diabetes, but at the same time, you know, it's not stage four cancer, but it's still heavy. Yeah. And I think, um, once throughout the hospital stay, you know, and seeing, okay, yep, she's going to be okay. This isn't, you know, it's manageable. There's tons of stuff out there seeing, you know, the various people who came in during the hospital, it was outstanding. Even like I, and I, I hear, you know, horror stories from people admitted and whatnot. And we had an unbelievable hospital stay. We had, we got connected with her current doctor, you know, when she was like, you know, I practice outpatient. She could be my patient if you're interested. And I'm like, absolutely. You, you seem great, mm. you know, and, uh, she, she is, her doctor's amazing. That stay in the hospital definitely helped, but it's still overwhelming, yeah. you know, and, and that fresh feeling of now what? And it doesn't take long for you to realize that as good as the hospital was and how, and as comfortable as they might've made you feel that they didn't really tell you like a small percentage of the things you're actually going to need to know. No fault of their own. Like how would they, but we, we yeah. were really, I feel like we were really lucky. We had an unbelievable educator. You've probably heard me talk about us med and how simple it is to reorder with us med using their email system. But did you know that if you don't see the email and you're set up for this, you have to set it up. They don't just randomly call you, but I'm set up to be called if I don't respond to the email because I don't trust myself uh, 100%. So one time I didn't respond to the email and the phone rings at the house. It's like, ring, you know how it works. And I picked it up. I was like, hello. And it was just the recording. It was like, you ask med. Doesn't actually sound like that, but you know what I'm saying. It said, hey, you're, uh, I don't remember exactly what it says, but it's basically like, hey, your order's ready. You want us to send it? Push this button if you want us to send it. Or if you'd like to wait, I think it, it lets you put it off like a couple of weeks or push this button for that. That's pretty much it. I pushed the button to send it. And a few days later, box right at my door. That's it. USmed.com slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. Get your free benefits checked now and get started with US Med. Dexcom, Omnipod, Tandem, Freestyle. They've got all your favorites. Even that new eyelet pump. Check them out now at USmed.com slash juice box or by calling 888 888- 721-1514. There are links in the show notes of your podcast player and links at juiceboxpodcast.com to US Med and to all of the sponsors. The podcast is sponsored today by the place where I get my, oh gosh, my sheets, my towels, some of my clothing, a lot of the things that I stay warm or comfortable with. Cozyearth.com. I'm wearing a pair of Cozy Earth joggers right now. I've recently gotten another pair in a different color. I sleep on Cozy Earth sheets. They are so comfortable and soft and temperate. Temperate meaning I'm never hot or cold, which is really saying something because my wife loves to turn that giant fan on, but they keep me nice and warm without making me like sweaty or moist. You know what I mean? You don't want to be moist while you're sleeping. And then, of course, the waffle towels I use every day to dry off my bits and parts after I've showered. Cozy Earth Dot com. Use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout to save 40% off of your entire order. I'm not saying 40% off of one item. I'm saying 40% off of everything you put in the cart. CozyEarth.com. Use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout. They got her CGM on her like day one or day two. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, super quick. It's just the connection of here's what's going to happen as far as you know here's your mdi here's how it works here's all the calculations we're not going to discharge you until you know what you're doing the nutritionist came in like uh, we were peppered with you and, felt ready yeah felt ready as possible 100%, i guess 100 yeah. like when we we left we 
I forget how long we were there, three days, four days. I mean, it was on the longer end compared to a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Let's say day three, like, I don't want to say we were experts, but we were pretty comfortable. Did that end up panning out like in real, real world play? Did you actually know what you were doing? I, I, yeah, I I think we we, like, I, and I attribute it to the, A, our, the dendrochronologist, amazing. And then the diabetes educator that we had, she also had type one. Okay. It was absolutely huge. I mean, she hit every point that you would want to know. And she really, truly educated us before we were discharged. What's your background that you felt like you picked it up so quickly? So I, I was an EMT. I was an EMT for about 10 years or so, high school through college. And now I'm a police officer. Now the medical aspect of things is always interest. I always had an interest in the medical field. Okay. I think it was a combination of maybe a little bit of my background. I did not, as an EMT, I definitely did not know diabetes until the diabetes, until Brianna was diagnosed and the educator. As far as like being an EMT police officer, you get very, very, very little training. You know, it's funny. I, I don't want to shift this onto me, but I just felt for the first time that I might get a PBA card out of this podcast, and I got really excited. You could, you could. <laughs> uh, I have one. <laughs> uh, you don't want to take responsibility for how I drive. Trust me. Um, uh, <laughs> all of my, not, um, I get it's not different than many people in New Jersey. New Jersey is. I don't know. I don't even know how to describe what I use driving for, but it's uh, some sort of a release. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Uh, Isn't that interesting? Because at work, you're constantly that's what you were alluding to earlier, like in like blood Mm -hmm. bang situations. You're okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's like and and my wife could see it as soon as, you know, it's one of my kids. She's just like, get out. And, And typically she doesn't deal with the blood and all that stuff. But when it comes to her kids, she's on it. So we kind of reverse roles with that. Yeah, that's the mom thing for sure. Yeah, yeah. That that whatever it's going to say blockade they throw up in their brain in situations like that is really impressive. You know, it's it's like a superpower. <laughs> it really is crazy. I'm like, oh my god! Like normally she's so goofy, and now that she's like seems to know what's happening. <laughs> so we have this. We have the same life. It's it's yeah superhero powers. No kidding. Really cool. Okay, so you've taken the the diagnosis as a trauma did you go to therapy yes so not initially initially i think we were still very much in the management stage just trying to figure it out and balance things out and more task oriented Mm -hmm. so even though i was crushed it took me a little bit of time I, i don't know let's say actually i guess it wasn't that long maybe a month and a half month to month and a half before I found somebody and the therapist that I found is a type one diabetic. I don't know that I knew that up front, but he, he was a former paramedic and I knew him. I, I've, I've been to training, you know, he's a little bit older than me. I've been to training with him. I, I know he trained me to some degree through various EMT classes and I knew who he was and I, that's how I found him. And I, I think it just happened that he happened to be a type one diabetic. Wow. So I kind of got a double benefit because yeah. he's familiar with the job and how I kind of react to things and deal with stuff. But then he also had the knowledge of diabetes, which was huge because he can put things in perspective and just simply say, you know, her blood sugar is 200. She's not going to die. Yeah. You know, Jesse, how, how old are you? 45. Oh, you're not that much younger than me. I'm sitting here as you're talking, and I thought, hey, this podcast keeps like surprising me as it grows. Like, <laughs> I didn't, if you would have asked me, like, where on my bingo card do I have like in touch, open, honest male cop on my uh, possibility of it recording with somebody, I would have put that pretty low on my list. You had me as young female mom. Yeah. <laughs> No kidding. Good for you. So I, I mean, I, I do have an interesting background. Like I started EMT wise and I went to school. I was the first one in my family to go to, away to school, go through college, got my master's degree. And I got my master's degree in community counseling. 
I have the degree in counseling. And I, at that point, I was like, I satisfied my family. I got my degree, but this isn't what I want to do. And I, I did a lot of internships and stuff in the inpatient, psychiatric inpatient because I liked the, the variety of it. Mm-hmm. And I quickly put myself through the academy, doing the police thing, and that's where I want to be. My background is not, not typical of a police officer. Yeah, I mean, I know a lot of cops. If you listen, you might know that, right? Like, mm-hmm. I, was, I was just at a retirement. My buddy just retired as a sergeant the other day, and I was, I was faced with all these guys I knew when I was younger who had all gotten older. It was such a crazy thing. I felt like I walked through a time warp. I was, you know, 18, 19, 20, and they were 23, 24, 25, 26, like back then. And then I get there and they're all like, you know, in their late 50s and early 60s. And I was like, what, what happened to you guys? <laughs> but they were all still very kind of classically the way you would expect them to be. Yes. And, and I think for people from the outside, you might have one picture. I find the people I know who are police officers to be really lovely people, but they're also more no bullshit people. They usually lean a little more conservative than liberal, maybe. Like they fit into a bit of a into a mold, right? Yep. But yep. but nobody you'd want more than them in any kind of a personal situation. Like anything. Like my lawnmower broke to my kid just fell out of a tree to I killed somebody. What do we do? These are the yep. people I would call. You know what I mean? Not one of them is anything like you. Oh. Super interesting. Do you feel proud of that? No, I, I, I do. Like I, I've been lucky to you. Ha- like I'm lucky to have the background that I do mm-hmm. retirement wise. I'm definitely thinking along the ways of counseling for kids with diabetes. Like really? that's kind of like, yeah, I mean, well, my wife's pushing me to do that because they're not out there. They, they, they really don't exist. It's, it's pretty tough. Right. Um, yeah. There's not a ton of them. I'm just, I'm just surprised you didn't say I'm going to work security at a car dealership because that's pretty much no, what no. So <laughs> I have the mindset that as soon as I retire, I'm doing nothing police related. Mm-hmm. So, and, and, and I think with my background, like I'm lucky I have that option, which is, which is kind of nice. Yeah. But you ever had to pull your weapon out? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yep. The thing had things changed over the last 10 years around here. Oh my goodness. The world we live in is crazy. Yeah. <laughs> it's the easiest way to put it. It's, it's, it's absolutely nuts. The thing that grounds me is the perspective and like, just, you got to put things in perspective. And like when going back to the diagnosis, I couldn't do it. Like, I, like you just spiral because it's, it's my kid. Mm-hmm. You got to look at the bigger picture. You got to look at, you know, what is the reality of stuff? And put things in perspective. So you're doing that? Is that helping you? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like I, I, I think as time has gone on, you become more educated, you you learn more, you're able to manage things, and you obviously become more confident and able to deal with stuff. It certainly helps. Yeah. I think for for me, where I'm at now, when I reached out to you to say, hey, I'm interested. You know, this diagnosis really crushed me, but at the same time, things were getting better and you are the physical and the daily management of things is easier as time goes on. And, you know, you're less, I guess, bothered by the late night lows or whatever it may be Mm -hmm. because you're just able to deal with it. But Brianna has had a hard time mentally since I put the request in to be on the podcast. So the whole mental health aspect of it is Uh, shifted from you to her. Like when I say like I was crushed, like I felt it, but I don't, she, she may have picked up on it, but I like, you know, like in your mind, you may think like a full blown depression. I wasn't there. It was just the, maybe more of like an anxiety of now what and having to move on and deal with it. But I think like I, I was able to do that relatively quickly, but for her, she internalizes things very much. So like where she feels like it, not that it's her fault, but it's that she's no good. 
And it's not, I know it's not all diabetes, the daily stressors of the disease has made things harder for much harder for her. Do you have examples of, of some things that have gotten, gotten the better of her? So I guess the latest thing for her is, you know, obviously I think most kids that are diagnosed obviously have to deal with their peers and a lot of the questions and things of that nature. And at first, Brianna was like, no shame. You know, here's my pod. Here's my Dexcom. This is what it does. Zero shame. She was out there. She was not afraid to show them. Mm -hmm. And that kind of slowly morphed into, well, I don't want to put it there today. I'd rather, you know, put it on my arm, wear long sleeves to so-and-so keeps asking me about it. And I I don't want to talk to him about it to... Um, I think the biggest challenge we had recently was her nurse, her regular nurse was out with an injury. So we had a couple of substitutes. So the consistency was difficult because she was, you know, she would text and say, I just got called down to the nurse's office for one thirty, you know, down, or they called me down to the nurse's office at 90 and they wouldn't let me go to, to class for 30 minutes. I treated with 15 carbs, but then they gave me another 15 carbs. So like a lot of different things. And like over like a month's period of time, I was trying to figure out how much of it was her just reacting to things or just having a hard time to how much of it was the nurses just not following the the plan. It took a little bit of time to try to figure it out. And I'm like, you know what? My daughter is really smart. She pretty much has this. Why am I relying on the nurses at this point? Because she's having a hard time with the nurses either over treating her or calling her down prior to a low to different, different things. Like one nurse just like to let her ride high. Another nurse would not be okay with the Dexcom continuously going down, even though she already treated and should be going back up so she would overdose or Give over too much yeah, yeah so once the new car smell like wears off and she's not like you know like i've got diabetes and it's cool and let me show you my stuff like once that happened that went away and by the way was that her or were you guys pumping her up like that do you think because i see that i see that sometimes like the parents are Mm-hmm. They get like cheerleaders and I'm like, oh, you know, you're trying to make something exciting. That's not really exciting. <laughs> you, you know, like, you no, know, I mean, insulin pumps are terrific and everything, but they're not like on the level of, have you seen my new iPhone? Yeah. In the beginning, I think we were pretty, we were very strong with the encouraging her to help others understand, mm-hmm. like educate kind of thing as far as showing stuff off. And I don't think so. Like, I don't think we pushed that with her, yeah. but we were definitely. Like I would say we were, you know, we're two type A parents and we were very much with the teach people about this. If they want to know, teach them, tell Mm -hmm. them, educate. I think she did, but I think it wore off to the point where she became annoyed with the yeah too too much. Right. And then the kid that wants to know too much, it stops being Mm -hmm. fun and it starts being like, um, leave me alone. And then the nurses start making mistakes and then everything Mm -hmm. is a hassle. Like it's holding her back instead of helping her. So like, you know, she's diagnosed at eight. So I kind of envisioned, you know, burnout happening like 13, 14, 15, someplace in there. But here we are at age nine and it's like kind of like a burnout. And it's, it's, she's been at it for a year. Yeah. I saw somebody online today. They were kind of lamenting all the things that have been going backwards for their kids since the diagnosis Mm -hmm. and Mm-hmm. It feels terrible when you're reading it, but like there's this part of me that knows like this is all normal, yep. which it sucks because you know your kid wishing that they were somebody else because they don't want to have diabetes or something like that is not a uh, it's not an easy thing to hear, obviously. But then you start you know I start hearing the um I can't take this anymore, like I can't do this anymore from the from the parents. Like I don't know how much longer I'm supposed to live without sleep, without this, without that. And I'm like, yeah, you're gonna do it. Like so. I mean, I'm not saying your attitude, you know, makes it better, but 
you got to get past the part where you're like, I can't because it does. I mean, yeah, I, I think the attitude is, is like I said, kind of going back to grounding and putting things in perspective. Like the, the attitude is key. Yeah. I, I, I find like me and my wife, we kind of like trade off, you know, she has bad days and it's like, this sucks. And mm-hmm. it's like, I got, all right, I got it. I'll, I'll deal with it tonight where, you know, I have bad days or just came home or something and she has it. So yeah, the, the attitude is key, but I, I think like personality goes into it for her a lot. Um, she is like, there's a control factor mm-hmm. and when she doesn't have control, it, it's very hard for her, you know, and talking to her teacher, the social worker and the nurse, the, the nurse wasn't on the same page, but at least the teacher and the social worker is like, she needs to be independent. She can do this on her own. Let her do this on her own and gave her carte blanche. Everything is yours. And nine years old, she's, she's rocking it. How do, how are her outcomes? Like what's her A1C like? In February 23, she was diagnosed. She was a 12.8. In May of 23, she went down to a 6.8. And then we were like a couple visits in between. We're 6.4, 6.3, 6.4. And then our latest visit, which was last week, a couple days ago, actually, was a 6.5. So Mm -hmm. she went up by 0.1. Oh, she's doing terrific. She's doing that by herself, mostly? Herself, 100%. Oh, jeez. She has brought up, like, you know, the nurses have said things to her, like, you shouldn't have just juice. You should stable, you should add protein and protein to help stabilize your sugars and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I see your point, you know, like to the ground, it's like, no, that's not how you do it. I got to have fast acting carbs. And then they're giving me additional carbs and proteins on top of the juice. And it's causing me to go high. And my pump's doing corrections, and then I'm hitting the low an hour or two hours later because... What kind of pump is she using? The Omnipod 5. Yeah. The Omnipod, we have it set at almost as aggressive as you can. We're, we're constantly in a state of flux where we're adjusting stuff, but I would say her target's 110. Her ratios are pretty aggressive. Correction factor's aggressive. Like We're pretty aggressive with things, but at the same time, You know, the endocrinologist says, don't correct under this circumstance. And she has followed her guidance, which is awesome. Yeah, wow. So do you think that having the management on her is part of her burden right now? Or do you think she's okay with that part of it? And it's more about the outside forces. So she's only been managing for completely by herself about a month. And it's been like night and day, uh, much better for her. The flip side is she's still nine. So she's a kid and she'll forget to dose. She'll not do a correction. You know, some of those things that you'd expect of a nine-year-old. So I bet she also doesn't like being told what to do by the nurses, especially when they're not right. Yeah. Like that, that was probably the biggest factor for her mental health. I mean, she and I didn't really see it as a father for a while as to how defeating or annoying it, it was to her. It it truly bothered her. Yeah. Now that she's doing it and she, she has more confidence, she feels better about herself. Every aspect about it thus far has been when we last week, when we met with the uh, endocrinologist, the social worker, the first thing the social worker said to her was, you know that you don't have to do this all by yourself, right? And she's like, no, I know. And she's like, you know, there are people to help you, right? And she's like, yeah, you know, like sometimes I forget and mom and dad help me. Sometimes mom and dad ask me, you know, what my number is, you know, different things like that, that, you know. It's most important that she just realizes that there's someone there, not maybe so much that she has to actually take them, uh, take them up on it all the time. I think maybe just knowing it's there is valuable. hundred percent. Cause yeah. she would take it on herself if she could a hundred percent. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, it's something it's super. Well, you know, I, I just put out an episode today. It's the first of a four part series with Erica about resilience. Mm. We really dug into what like being resilient means and how people end up in that situation. It's not as clear cut as I think we make it out to be. It's pretty it's really very interesting. A lot about like what's happened to you in the past, how you face things you have a much better chance that there's this list. It's called like the aces list. I'm going to do a lot of this off the top of my head, but uh, for people who have lived through certain issues, they have different challenges, physical, sexual, verbal abuse, physical, emotional neglect, living in a household with mental illness, growing up a parent who's addicted to drugs or alcohol. If someone in your home has been imprisoned, witnessing abuse, losing a parent to divorce, separation, or death, like these things all impact how you manage like stresses and how resilient you actually are as an adult. It's super crazy and interesting. Mm. And it's very often not up to you. Mm. Yeah. So we spent a lot of time picking through it. It's interesting because you, you describe you and your wife as very type A. Yes. You know, like, and so your daughter, I guess, likely is too. Like, even that's what I hear, which doesn't want the nurses to tell her the wrong thing. Yep. You know, a lot of people, they'll just listen to authority and do what they're told. And if it's wrong, they'll go, well, they were wrong, not me. And then it's all gone. But she doesn't want someone else in control of it. She doesn't even really want you guys in control of it. It doesn't sound like. No. Yeah. And it's, and she, you know, as a kid, it's tough because she, she has to balance the listening to authority and she, 100% wants to do that and does that because mm -hmm. she has those values and everything else. But at the same time, she also wants the control to, or at least like you said, if they're doing something wrong, she just more often than not will take it and listen to the authority. And that would make her feel worse yeah, because yeah, she, she feels like she knew the right thing to do. Right. And she's yeah. not in control. Hmm. But well, this is this is very new, developing to say the least for mm -hmm. you guys. Resilience is a. I think there's like certain key words like you know putting things in perspective. Resilience, patience. With I, I don't like. I think resilience is probably the best word, but to be that way, like you said, I I don't. I think your life experiences help you to do that. Like, yeah. uh, I like find it after having the conversation with Erica, it's largely not up to you how resilient you are. Like my mentality is adapt and overcome. You just got to do it unless it comes to my kids. <laughs> right. <laughs> but do you, can you look back on your childhood and figure out where that comes from? Yeah. Like I, it's definitely your upbringing. I think like uh, my father was tough. He was definitely disciplinarian kind of thing, authoritarian, but he, he also very much so challenged us. Mm -hmm. Everything was, you know, try to figure this out and do well. And he, he, he pushed us to do well, motivated. So I think that it, it kind of put you on that track. Yeah. You, you're kind of put in the position where you have to do it. Right. I think, you know, like I hear a lot at work and stuff like Gen Z, Gen X, you know, different, you know, every, the, the word is like, it, it's just a different breed. I don't, completely subscribe to it it's it's true like it's it, generational differences is you know there's clearly differences but i i think part of it is the world and how they're growing up today is different than when we grew up you know like just think of like the playgrounds when we were kids in 1980s the playgrounds at school were considered death traps in the 1980s and i wouldn't go out and play without getting like a splinter or banging your head on a, a metal bar or something like that whereas today everything is padded and low to the ground and you know just super super safe that it's you know it's, it's almost like over compensation it doesn't allow kids to to learn yeah i wonder how how that's going to change because your daughter's a completely new generation now. I mean, at eight mm -hmm. years old, you know, and your son, even mm -hmm. at five, like, right. Like where does this like, cause they, they're going to fast forward through so much stuff, like things that we would have spent years adapting to, they learn about 
get thrown into, figure out, and move past sometimes in weeks. Yep. It's kind of fascinating. Like, I, I, I think it's going to overall make people more capable, mm -hmm. you know, but like in those in between generations, for the people who weren't accustomed to it, it, it was a big shift, you, yeah. you know, like a, like a really, really big shift. I feel lucky that I paid attention to technology early on in my life and I kept up with it because I think that keeps me like nimble and mm -hmm. like, you know, I see something new and I'm like, ah, that won't work. But then you see another thing and you go, that's a good tool. I should learn how to use that. Then you use it. You learn, you know, then you have to be careful. You don't start learning so many things that actually, you can't actually apply them. And then when I kind of explode that out into real life, like I, I wonder how many things kids are taking in that are valuable and how many things they're taking in because it's in their face and you feel like, oh, I need to learn this new thing, but it really, it, it won't hold any long-term value for you. Right. It's super interesting. Like, I mean, like I can't wait to do this podcast for 10 more years and talk to like your daughter 10 years from now, like, and see where she's at. Cause she's probably going to be fine. And you'll realize that a lot of this was just, necessary to have happen and that the real key to the whole thing is to not get stuck in one place like not hit quicksand and think oh god this problem right here is gonna define us and then you worry about it so much you can't get past it you know what i mean yep and i i think for her and people growing up you know today it's the management tools are change evolving and changing so much that it's like all these tools or resources are are available, at least for the physical part of it. I think the mental health side, it's tough. Like there's not a ton out there for the mental health aspect. Yeah. But I take your point. Especially with kids. Think about this though. 30 years ago, an eight-year-old type one who's had diabetes for a year mm. could not have said, I have a mid six A1C that I manage on my own. And my biggest problem is that my nurse doesn't understand fat and protein and how it pushes up my blood sugar later and how to get, yeah. like, I mean, those people were back there going, Oh, the doctor told me I'm going to die in my thirties. So I mean like the management's evolving so quickly that her and even new generation, it's like, they're going to have different experiences. And it should allow them to focus more on the mental health side of diabetes, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. might be one of the, might end up being one of the more like unsung heroes of the technology. Like, you know, like we think about it in all the other aspects of life, right? Like your car drives itself. You don't have to do this. You're, you know, this does that, like, you know, takes this load from you. What do you do with that time once the, the load's been taken away? And mm. I would say that type ones historically are so busy keeping themselves alive in the moment. They don't have time to think about big picture stuff. And maybe now they will. Like maybe now you can throw in an Omnipod 5, uh, an eyelet pump, a uh, tandem something or other, like, you know what I mean? And let the thing run your A1C in the sixes. You figure out the nuts and bolts of it. You move past that part. And now you have like time and, and bandwidth to think about the other stuff. Like, you know, and maybe you'll, you'll end up with a more complete person at the end because of that. Set it and forget it. You know, hopefully, hopefully they, some people figure it out. Like, I mean, it's not always, I don't see how it can be perfect ever, but you know, right now, but the algorithms are insane. Like I'm updating Arden tonight to another algorithm. Mm. So, you know, she's been using IAPS. Now she's going to move on to a different one. I love seeing where all this stuff goes and, and, and what it lends you back. Like that's the part, man, that like what it gives you back in, in, in time and, Again, bandwidth, I don't think we're even up to appreciating that all yet. You know what I mean? Even just like uh, people use a GLP medication, they don't use as much insulin. You think, oh, there's great reasons like, you know, to not use as much insulin. But how about like, uh, you know, removing acne or PCOS problems for girls? Or what about just use less insulin, you know, fewer insulin units, fewer lows, less Repound highs from medications like that kind of layer or from eating and, and trying to stop below like all of that stuff just removes a layer of complexity like over and over and over again. It, it, yeah. I, I, anyway, I, I want to keep doing this. I, I think the stories might be even crazier 10 years from now. You had that one person on who I forget that you brought back and I, I don't know if she was an exchange student and I forget her name, 
but it was interesting to hear her story like four years later or whatever. Um, I think you had her on initially a diagnosis and then like four years later where she was. Um, was it from Russia with sarcasm? Yes. 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 Okay. That's the one. Yeah. Yeah. That was really cool to see because like uh, you got, you know, the real life version of where they're at and, you know, some things are good. Some things are bad. You just, you just deal with it and, you know, you move on. But no, I agree. Even cool. She had like a tragic personal yep. thing happen in her family. And even though you could tell she's dazed from it still, yep. she's moving. She's still moving in the right direction. And, and you know, hearing those stories like it's it's huge because like you know other people can relate the beginning of her story is crazy she lived in russia when she was diagnosed she's in i think she's in america at college now she didn't have access to a lot of the tools and or anything she didn't really know what she was doing so well you have to go back it's called from russia with sarcasm she's like 14 when i'm interviewing her and she found by herself the podcast figured out all the tools she needed to take good care of herself at 14, went to her parents and said, I need you to find out how to get me an Omnipod and a CGM. And like, she, she basically tasked her parents with like, fine, get these things for me in a country where they were not particularly available. They sourced the things for her. She puts her A1C crazy good, takes care of herself completely. And then, you know, like just has the greatest outlook on things. That is Brianna. Brianna is very much, here's what I need. This is, you know, and and what's interesting to me is, you know, in the beginning, she was, I don't want to say showing stuff off, but she, she had no shame. Then she moved into, well, you know, I'd rather not talk about it to now. I mean, she listens to your podcast regularly. No, hey, I'm like, and and I'm like, I'm like, all right, Bree, let's, let's turn this off. You know, like I'm sick of hearing Scott's voice. Let's turn this off. <laughs> Listen, you <laughs> can like, turn the volume down, Jesse, and let it finish. I guess, so I, mean, I get or, the download, or, you know what I mean? <laughs> or headphones, something, but I, uh, you know, like to the point that like, listen, you, as a parent, like I think one of the struggles, you know, of somebody so young is balancing. It's not all diabetes, you know, mm-hmm. uh, let's, let's tune out. Let's, go something else, you know, let's not make it all diabetes, but she's also in a place where she, she wants to learn, which is, which is awesome. Yeah. But it's just really fantastic to think that, that she might be able to find herself Mm -hmm. and and her answers in other people's stories. And again, there's a thing technology brings to you, right? Because if you go back 10, 15 years, I don't think in a lifetime you could meet a thousand people with diabetes and hear their story you know, 10 years ago, how would you do that? Now you just like, you know, subscribe to a podcast. Yeah. People will ask me times like, why does it take so long to get on the show? Well, when you stop and look at Jesse's note, I'm going to read your note. Keep in mind, it's not even the one you probably started out writing. Probably not. It, newly diagnosed child resources, support, learning diabetes is tough, but the emotional aspects is being missed. Everyone is in a state of trauma and they just react for good reasons, but the mental health, element is absent then navigating these emotions and learning diabetes as time progresses does the trauma ever end for the child and for the parents also i have to navigate schools and camps and keeps kids safe and that that was probably written six months ago you're not even that person anymore yeah i remember it i definitely remember that stage but it's that's not not the part you're in now we're not trauma we're not screaming at everything um yeah it's definitely different yeah that's the lesson Jesse. And one of the reasons why it takes six months to come on the show, because you'll actually have something to talk about when you get here. Mm -hmm. And then this will sit and marinate for months before it goes up. And when you hear it back, I guarantee you'll listen back and think I'm not even there anymore. Like, and to me, that's the takeaway for people is that, you know, train keeps on rolling. I think the biggest mistake people make, and if it's a mental health issue, sometimes it's not a mistake. It's just what happens to you but it's that getting stuck in the mud and then not Mm -hmm. getting away, realizing that this thing as important as it seems at the moment with just a tiny bit of hindsight will seem irrelevant and just be a small portion of like my perspective and not the entirety of my life. Going back to that, that word perspective, I think for me, that's, it's huge because there are many, many moments 
that are muddy and challenging and whether it's nighttime lows or just a stubborn high, whatever the case may be, like there's, there's moments that are challenging, but the overall perspective and the overall, like, you know, just moving in the right direction, it's, you know, we're only just over a year into this and that journey over the past year has been, it's been a roller coaster, you know, looking back at it, but it's, uh, you know, we're still riding it. And it's, it's one of those things that I, I think when I wrote that note, one of our challenges was the support, you know, just getting her connected with like a mentor or other kids that, you know, she can share. And she has a couple of friends, you know, who've been diagnosed that she's met along the way, one at camp, a couple at the walk uh, and different events, but nothing close and personal. And I, I don't, I just think she's not ready for it, or maybe it's just not the right connection, but she does occasionally text, you know, all three or four of them Mm -hmm. with, you know, notes like, Hey, how are things check out, you know, screenshots of her sugar pixel or whatever, and different things that like they do talk, but you know, not super often, but I, I think she's missing. Well, she was missing and now is getting connected with like, she she tends to connect with older girls that share what they have and she views them as kind of like an authority figure or like uh somebody with knowledge that she wants to learn or hey that's a cool teenager who's who knows and it's not mom and dad i think that will be really helpful for her and our, our doctor's office actually has just connected us with somebody that hopefully that works out well for her She's also the type that wants to be the the ambassador, you know, that wants to teach others. And if she can't find those people, she always has a 52 year old guy with a podcast she can listen to, which I think <laughs> is just a very crazy pairing. But I, <laughs> I, I tell you what, though, like it, it helps. Like I, I don't, I wouldn't know what it feels like to be in her shoes with the constant Bree, what's your sugar? Bree, did you dose? Bree, you're really high. You know, like it's constant. And we, me and me and my wife try not to harp on that stuff, but we're also type A and we kind of, we try to stay on top of it as best we can Yep. without harassing her. But, um, you know, it's, it's that balance. And I think by her taking ownership and listening on her own and, really wanting to and doing it on our own is, is pretty cool. Well, Jesse, it sounds to me like you guys are doing really well. And my question, <laughs> like my, my question would be, does, does it feel that way? No, no. And that's, that's the tricky part. Like I, I honestly, and I can't say no, like we, we are definitely moving in the right direction, but it's, it, it's like one step forward, two steps back kind of thing. You know, there, there's been some other things that I would say, mental health wise are not diabetes related Mm -hmm. pre diabetes. Like we had her connected with a counselor for like, you know, at three years old, like she would hit herself, you know, just saying like, I'm, I'm no good. And would hit herself when we'd say, Hey Brie, can you please clean your room up a little bit of it? I'm just no good. And she would hit herself kind of thing. And it's like, so that kind of stuff, you know, has nothing to do with diabetes, but I think the diabetes definitely amplifies things to that nth degree may i suggest jesse to take a cue from your medical stuff and make sure they're tracking her tsh and her thyroid stuff too so that was just included in her recent orders i'd have to look back to see if it was ever previously tested going forward yes yeah just because some anxiety and even like personality stuff Mm -hmm. could Mm -hmm. be thyroid related Mood swings. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. For sure. Just keep that in your head. That's all. Absolutely. Yeah. And it also, by the way, a well regulated thyroid makes blood sugars easier to manage, too. That's interesting. Yeah. So, but, I mean, what, like, there's a pretty good percentage of diabetics who have Hashimoto's as well, right? I mean, I don't know what it is, but when somebody tells me they have type one and Hashimoto's, I don't go, oh, gosh, really? That's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> mm-hmm. it, it, it seems to be a, a more common theme. Yeah. I mean, uh, autoimmune can run in families and yeah. it doesn't always have to be like, I have type one. So you have type one. It could be a number of different things. 
It just can't. I mean, it's clearly in my family. My daughter's got issues that, you know, are not are more than type one. My son has Hashimoto's. My wife has thyroid. You know, like my son will talk sometimes about like I'm cold, you know, even though he's really good with his medication is, and his TSH levels are great. Arden is exhausted without a Cytomil uh, supplement to her T4 supplement when she's taking her thyroid medications. She definitely is hypermobile to some degree. She's creaky and cracky and stiff and, you know, joints ache at times, stuff like that. Probably not RA. It's all that stuff, man. Like, you know, like you start, my wife started using a GLP and she's like, oh, my inflammation went down so much, like just from the GLP medication. She's like, I wonder how much this inflammation is just impacting my life. And I, I a hundred percent take her, uh, you know, at her word. I describe my autoimmune as, it, to, to sum it up, it's an inflammation disorder. No, it's, that's what, it, that's it's what it is. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, everything's just... Essentially. There, listen, this is completely unfounded, then I have to let you go, okay? <laughs> but there was a time where there were people running around the diabetes community, and they were saying, your beta cells aren't dead, they're just frozen. They're, there's no room in there, so they can't move. I forget the exact way it was put, Right. And now tomorrow I have an episode coming out with a 50 year old, eight year old type one who took Manjaro for weight and for insulin resistance. And it works so well for him. He's not on insulin anymore. Like, I, I don't even know what to say about that. Like, I, I've, I'm, I'm not drawing a conclusion from it even. I'm just telling you, 50 years old diagnosed. Uh, if I'm remembering his timeline right, he honeymooned for a while, four or five years. Then for the last couple of years, then the next couple of years, like heavy usage of insulin, right where you would expect. Then they put him on Mangiarno and he does not use insulin anymore. And he's got autoantibodies. He has type one diabetes and he'll very likely need insulin again at some point in his life. But for the moment, that's, he's not using it. That's very interesting. Ridiculous. Like a 15 year old girl a couple months ago, her mom came on. She's gone from 70 units a day down to four and doesn't bolus for meals anymore and took off her pump. Yeah. So I don't know, it's, man. It's, it's I, impressive. I mean, the thing, uh, the amount of studies that are going on now, like you can only hope. I mean, it's, it's, it's very positive. You got to figure a lot. It's not, everything's not going to work for everybody, but some things are going to work for a lot of people. And that's, that that's where you want to be excited and, and have people continuing to look. Jesse, I'm going to say thank you right here. This is a great time to uh, stop. I thought you were fantastic. I say this every time after I speak with someone like you. There, if there are more men out there in touch with their feelings, please reach out to be on the podcast. I'll even talk to you guys that aren't. You're fun, too. Um, but I don't get as many men, so I appreciate you reaching out. I really do. Uh, all I could say is I'm definitely typically not the emotional person, but in this topic, in this realm, it, it, it got me. And diabetes brought you there. That's for sure. It got me. Yep. Let me ask one last question. Mm -hmm. Is there value in that for you? Like if you can like let go of the part that diabetes is what brought it here. Like, are you happy that you have these connections now or are they hard to deal with? I think it's, it's one of those things like as I get older, you appreciate more and you understand more and you kind of just, you comprehend it better. Mm -hmm. But I'm not an emotional guy, so it, it's not comfortable for me. It's not my wheelhouse. It's not like, you know, I don't enjoy having the, you know, range of emotions or, you know, whatever. It's, it's, it's typical. It's not typical of me, but at the same time in the realm that it's happening and truly wrapping your head around all that's going on, it just gives you a better perspective. And you just like, for me, it's, it's, it's a growth type thing. Like I'm, I'm at that age where you just, you learn from it, you, you appreciate it. And it's, it, it, it's helped me. I mean, if I were to take it back, I guess I would probably go back and say, nope, no emotion and just get things done and do it my typical way. I think I, there's no other way for me. Okay. That's the best way to put it. Oh, that was very honest. I appreciate that. Thank you. Wow. All right. Hold on one second for me. Uh, but you were terrific. Thank you. Appreciate it. This good times. Huge thanks to Cozy Earth for sponsoring this episode of the Juice Box Podcast. CozyEarth.com. Use the offer code JUICEBOX at checkout to save 40% off of your entire order. This episode of the Juice Box Podcast was sponsored by U.S. Med. 
usmed.com slash juice box or call 888-721-1514. Get started today with US Med. Links in the show notes, links at juiceboxpodcast.com. A huge thank you to one of today's sponsors, Gvoke Glucagon. Find out more about Gvoke Hypopen at gvokeglucagon.com forward slash juice box. You spell that G V O K E G L U C A G O N dot com forward slash juice box. If you or a loved one was just diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and you're looking for some fresh perspective, the Bold Beginning series from the Juice Box podcast is a terrific place to start. That series is with myself and Jenny Smith. Jenny is a CDCES, a registered dietitian, and a type 1 for over 35 years. And in the Bold Beginning series, Jenny and I are going to answer the questions that most people have after a type 1 diabetes diagnosis. The series begins at episode 698 in your podcast player, or you can go to juiceboxpodcast.com and click on Bold Beginnings in the menu. If you're not already subscribed or following in your favorite audio app, please take the time now to do that. It really helps the show. And get those automatic downloads set up so you never miss an episode. Thank you so much for listening. I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Juice Box Podcast. The episode you just heard was professionally edited by Wrong Way Recording. WrongWayRecording.com.